Douglas Rushkoff has been described as one of the world's 10 most influential thinkers. He began his career documenting the psychedelic culture that created the early internet. Then with books like Throwing Rocks at the Google Bus, he started sounding the alarm about what technology was doing to society. He's described his most recent book, Team Human, as a mic drop moment and a manifesto to recover human values in a digital age. Douglas, thank you for making the time to do this. This is actually the second time we've done an interview and the first time was one of the very few occasions that we had technical problems and it ended up being unusable. So thank you for making time the second time. And I guess the good thing is that I've, I've, I can remember some of the good answers that you gave last time so we can kind of d dive into that, I hope. Um, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to this because your, your recent book, Team Human, and the trajectory that you've been on seems very similar to the trajectory that we've been on since the beginning of the channel. Uh, kind of really coming home to uh, real conversations, human contact, and how that's really important for getting out of some of the cultural kind of messes that we seem to have got ourselves into. So I'd, I'd love to hear, what, what has your kind of journey with this been like? Well, my journey's been a long one, you know. I mean, for me, it started with, um, with theater, really. And um, I, was, I was interested in, in, well, I was interested in theater and medicine at the same time, because I wanted to know what, what animated human beings. You know, what's the difference between a living one and a dead one? And, you know, the medicine... And biology are really interested in that, you know, what, what constitutes life. When does, when does physics or chemistry become biology? And theater's interested in that because what we're trying to do is to figure out what is a human being in action? What is this, what is a person? What is intention? What is their will? You know, and, and I played with both and got disillusioned with both. I got disillusioned with medicine because it was way too uh, uh, empirical. You know, there wasn't any vitalism in it. There was nothing, uh, it didn't acknowledge the weirdness that actually keeps us going. And uh, theater, I got sick of because it was so expensive for people to go to. And elitist and closed ended. Every play kind of ended the same way, you know, and, and some tragedy or marriage, you know, big crisis, climax, completion. And um, right around then, the internet came around and it seemed to answer all of my uh, needs for a, an egalitarian people's participatory medium, where instead of watching some hero do stuff, you are the hero, you're engaging. And then you're not just engaging in fiction, you're engaging for real in this kind of fact-based world. And now we can start solving solutions together in bottom-up ways and remake the economy to be circular instead of extractive and change institutions and relationships. And um, I got excited. But then by the mid to late 90s, once the internet also became the poster child for the NASDAQ stock exchange and big business, uh, they pivoted the net from a, uh, a, a people's medium, a connecting people's medium to a data extraction platform. And all of these tools, all of the software, all of these devices uh, were, were really programmed to keep us apart from one another and turn us back into isolated, individual, manipulable customers and voters and uh, uh, machines, really. So uh, I guess what, that, what, what I came all the way back around to was that, you know, people actually have the ability to connect, you know, without anything, without even, without theater, God forbid, uh, or, or without... Uh, uh, without a machine, without a device, without a game, that people can, can recalibrate themselves really simply and easily just by making eye contact for five seconds. You undo, you know, 10 hours of computer addiction and, and uh, uh, alienation and atomization. So uh, now I'm really kind of all about helping people find the opportunities and the courage to engage with one another in the flesh, in real ways, you know, in, in real spaces. And that 
um, that's the great conspiracy. And that's literally what the word conspiracy means, to conspire is to breathe together. You know, so people breathing together constitutes a conspiracy against the dehumanizing forces of, uh, of digital capitalism. And how would you summarize uh, Team Human as your contribution to that? Well, Team Human really started as a way originally for me to have an excuse to engage with other people. And it's, uh, it's turned into a way for me to kind of amplify and spread the messages of, of others rather than myself. You know, I've written 20 books and made all these documentaries and done all this. It's like, I feel like I've made my contribution or gotten as much attention as any person deserves. And the best thing I can do with that attention is highlight, you know, people who are uh, helping us uh, restore those, the, the, those human connections and really the value of being human. You know, human beings are, are at least in, in Silicon Valley terms, human beings are understood as the problem and technology is the solution. You know, when you look at any human problem from climate change to racism to everything, and we'll say, oh, that's because of those humans. And we've got to develop better platforms and better systems. Um, and it's like, you know, you know, there's the systems and the platforms that are corrupting the humans, uh, I think. And uh, uh, I'm sort of dedicating, you know, Team Human to the, the celebration of the weirdness of the, the stuff between the lines, the things about us that can't be quantized by digital technology. You know, nothing against digital, and, and we are for sure, we're migrating into a digital media environment. But if we're gonna do that, we better start compensating now for what digital doesn't recognize. What aspects of humanity does digital not see? You know, just as we understand, you know, Marx showed us how industrialism doesn't respect the human worker. Um, digital doesn't respect um, the human weirdness. It doesn't respect the stuff that can't be quantized, the liminal things between the lines, you know, the, the, the strangeness of human experience, you know, in our, in our, uh, you know, and I understand our, our, our understandable quest to, you know, upload consciousness to a machine or to augment ourselves with some kind of digital robotic sensor matrix thing. Um, uh, we're, we're too ready to dismiss the stuff that can't get uploaded as noise, as meaningless. And it's not noise. That's, if anything, that's the signal. You know, whatever it is that can't be repeated digitally, that can't be uh, uh, copied, that's the stuff that's most valuable. That, that's the stuff we have to save. There's a, there's a concept called spiritual bypass that I'm not sure if, whether you're familiar with. That there's something about that in this kind of the big tech um, view of human nature. It's kind of almost like a human bypass. I mean, I don't know about spiritual bypass, but you mean the, the I mean, I do think that there's a, um, a, a anti-spiritual uh, premise in, in Silicon Valley. Uh, it doesn't mean they don't have their own religion, but they think of themselves as anti-spiritual materialists who are simply observing information uh, evolving through increasingly complex states. And that as long as information is, is here, it's gonna look for more complex kind of hosts. So it moves from you know, atoms to molecules, to organelles, to organisms, to culture, and eventually to computers. And at that point, when computers and quantum computing or whatever it is in AI are more complex than we are, then information continues its journey without us and we can just you know, fall by the wayside. And I would argue that's anti-spiritual. I think they would say it is spiritual. Kurzweil would say, well, that's more spiritual than anything, and that I'm being an egocentric uh, human, you know, and, and, and that, I'm, that I'm, a, I'm a shill for Team Human. I mean, but that's, that's what I am. I'm a shill for Team Human. I'm, I'm asking the question about, would it be so terrible to keep us around? You know, maybe, do we have a role? Is there something that we do that our computers don't and can't? 
Um, and I think there is. I think that we're, I think we're special. I think we have soul. I think there's a, a, a formal cause to humanity. You know, and that's really what, what Aristotle would have called psyche and we would call soul. And it's, it's difficult to, to describe in like, you know, Francis Bacon, empirical scientific terms, but that doesn't mean it's not, it's not real. You know, it's what's holding you together. What, what's, what's organizing you? What's the impetus for all this? And uh, until we know that, I'm not comfortable cutting ties with, with it, with, with the, the sort of the formal causes of, of us. That's a really interesting frame, I guess, of the, the kind of implicit cosmology structure of kind of Silicon Valley, which I'm slightly surprised about given the influence of something like Burning Man and the influence of psychedelics on the beginning of that. Did, was, it ever, was it ever different? Yeah, I, I do get, I mean, it was different, right? It was different when it was the Grateful Deadheads uh, running Silicon Valley, when it was the really sort of early, even pre-Steve Jobs, you know, uh, computer clubs and homebrew stuff and the well and the merry pranksters and all. Um, there was uh, a much crunchier San Francisco vibe to all of this. I mean, when money came in, and the libertarians came in, it, it became something else, you know, then, then the California ideology was born. And uh, they would argue it's much more rational, you know, but it's, it's actually kind of insane. It's what leads to the, the, the egomania and, and uh, accelerationism and, and sort of exponential mindset. You know, the only thing that grows exponentially in nature is cancer and it kills the host. You know, you can't, um, you can't use an exponential uh, model for human society or for human marketplaces or anything. That's just, it's just, then it's people serving balance sheets. It's people serving numbers. Even the billionaires don't need that accumulation. You don't need a trillion dollars. You don't need multiple billions. You really be okay with even just tens of millions. You'll somehow survive at pretty much the same level, I think. You know, so, so how does that excess happen? That excess happens because the, the, the program is bad. You know, and they think it's, I, they think they're optimizing the program by leading to uh, creating all this extraction, but it, it's not, it's not, it's, it's, it's out of, it's out of sync with anything that matters or, so it's a, uh, I don't know if that answers your question. Well, if it doesn't, it was a really nice digression. So it was probably better than you answering the question. Um, are you familiar with the concept of the, the paperclip maximizer? which I, I don't think it originated with Daniel Schmachtenberger, but he did a good podcast with Charles Eisenstein about it. No, tell me. So it's kind of implicit in what you were just saying. And I'm saying. concerned. I'm, I do get concerned. It's funny the way we're talking. It's, again, it's, it's, there's a lot of white guys in their 30s and 40s, you know, it's like you and me and Charles and this guy. And they, we're just talking about all these dudes you know, and it's it's interesting. So it, it there there's something about even this great conversation that still ends up feeling like, you know, stone guys in a good Ivy League dorm room, you know, talking about the future of our species. It's part of the problem is that we end up with there's a particular kind of thinking that that we all do as kind of college educated nerdy white men that's just it feels a little digital to me it feels a little bit like we know how to make these points but we're missing all that space between the points you know and that's i mean that's the problem with any intellectual heady philosophical discussion about about the world and it's kind of why i i and you hear even when i talk about it now i talk so little about uh, my ideas and so much more about kind of history, like this, telling the story. This is what happened, and here's who took over, and here's why these kids felt this way. Um, and it is, I mean, the, the question you were asking before is basically, 
how can these people go to places like Burning Man or go down to South America and do ayahuasca and trip their brains out and still be fucking assholes? You know, that's sort of, that was the question that was bothering me for the last 10 years or so. And I remember it was, uh, it was actually longer. It was when I was in college and I tripped and said, oh my God, now I see how everything's connected. And then I saw there's people tripping in the parking lot of the ACDC concert who still just like, they trip and they break glass and stuff and smash beer bottles. And it's like, wait a minute, you're tripping. Shouldn't you be seeing the clear light of the essential human experience? And now you're just being fucking assholes. And that's why you can have the chairman of Google and Apple and everything. They can go and they can have these experiences and they can hear the earth, you know, cry to them. But then they're going to conclude that, oh, and the way I'm going to fix all this is by, you know, bringing the world's information to them through a good search engine or, uh, you know, creating uh, uh, electric cars and spaceships and get us off the planet and all. So, you know, just because you've gone to Burning Man or had one of these experiences doesn't mean that you are ready to embrace the full spectrum of humanity. It's, for a lot of people, it doesn't really crash the walls of ego at all. But uh, on some ways, it, in, some, in some cases, makes them more rigid, you know, which is, it's, it's surprising. But again, it's what Timothy Leary used to talk about way back when. It's your set and your setting. What set and setting are you doing this? Are you doing it in a way, are you really willing to, to rip open the fabric of reality and challenge who and who you are and what you've lived for, or you just want to have a good pyrotechnic kind of Disney experience. Or also the idea that psychedelics are just a non or are a non-specific amplifier. You're not necessarily for 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 you or for me. It might be amplifying that sort of uh, more spiritual dimension, but then it, it can amplify any any dimension. There's no kind of necessarily. It's kind of an amoral. Thing. And I was hoping it wasn't. You know, I didn't think it was. You know, I, I originally thought, well, maybe LSD and some of the 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 chemical, synthetic chemical uh, psychedelics are amoral. But you know, the vision vine from the forest peoples would somehow let the spirit of the earth speak to speak to a person. You know, that those have sort of more personality or voices in them. And again, I guess they have voices in them for certain people and different voices for others. I first became aware of your work through the Throwing Rocks at the Google Bus book. And it was actually only sort of in the, in the run-up to the last interview that I was aware of sort of your, your interest in the psychedelic world and your long kind of history with, with this conversation. Um, could, you, could you describe a little bit of that? What, what, what was your background in that. I know that you were, you were friends with Timothy Leary, is that, is that right? And you were also connected to Robert Anton Wilson. Could you, could you describe a little bit or expl explain some of that history? It was a different era, you know, the late 80s and early 90s. And it was on, in some ways easier to find people and connect with them. And um, if you were willing, you know, it was, it was, people were more naive too about things. You could go somewhere and say you're going to write an article or do a book on something. People just spoke with you. Everybody was candid. Now, you know, people are different about news. Everybody's kind of media savvy and uh, uh, they want a piece of it. Oh, you're writing a book. Well, what am I going to get? You know, and it's publicity. You know, they don't just let you walk around with them and, and, and chill. So, uh, you know, I was living in Los Angeles and interested in a lot of these sort of early crazy cyber stories. I was interested in why were my most psychedelic friends from college moving out to Silicon Valley and becoming computer people? Because these were not computer types. These were Grateful Deadheads. These were, you know, uh, uh, creative theater artsy people doing computer. So I... Uh, started following that and seeing that, oh, I get it. It's because these technologies are so hallucinatory that you need people uh, uh, well-versed in hallucinations to play with them, to, to feel confident enough to render these worlds 
that the rest of humanity was going to be living in. I was just kind of welcomed in as a, a you know young member of this uh, uh, community that that realized that you know digital was the next uh, landscape for human consciousness, and that was this something big was happening. You know, the counterculture saw digital first. We couldn't hold on to it, but but we saw it first. So um, they just became, uh, uh, you know, friends and mentors and... Yeah, I mentioned Robert Anton Wilson specifically because that name's come up quite a few times recently. We did an interview with Eric Davis about... He, he's just done a book called Higher Weirdness that is partly about Robert Anton Wilson. And then Jamie Wheel mentioned him as well as as realizing how much of an impact reading him as a, as a young man has had on him since. The concepts of reality tunnels and the kind of, the idea of sort of fake news or conspiracy theory, sort of going deeply into conspiracy theory. In reality tunnels in particular seems to kind of define the modern world probably as well as anything. Would you agree? Yeah, I mean, his idea of reality tunnels is what now in a digital age we're calling filter bubbles. You know, except, you know, reality tunnels were kind of more self-composed, where filter bubbles are composed by algorithms on our behalf. You know, and that's, that's a little different. You know, so, so we're not totally in control of it. You know, it's, it's one thing when we're all looking at the same reality and then devising our own interpretations or tunnels from it. It's different when we're all being shown different realities and coming up with our own tunnels. So, so it's really hard to find, to find common ground. Uh, but the other thing that he, he was part of was, uh, you know, Operation Mindfuck. Operation Mindfuck was like the, the it's what today's become fake news. You know, Operation Mindfuck was a counterculture technique to uh, really toy with people's reality. You know, even, uh, oh, we're going to levitate the Pentagon. And we did it. You know, and then it, it, you create such cognitive dissonance that people don't know what to trust anymore. And the idea was it would break open uh, uh, mainstream culture. It would help break people of the kind of consumerist delusion of mainstream culture, challenge their reality. Kind of social anarchy almost. Yeah, but I mean, a real, uh, a genuine social anarchy, it requires human beings who are at least, you know, functioning with some pretense of compassion. It's funny, I wrote a book on, uh, on Judaism way back when, and I was arguing that Judaism is sort of, uh, uh, it's, all, uh, it's all captured by Joan Rivers when she used to say, um, can we talk? Can we talk? She'd always say, can we talk? And can we talk means can we talk? Can we be frank here? Can we actually say, this is bullshit, right? This is not real. This is, it's just you and me, right? And all this social construction is, can we talk? But in order to talk, she had, she had this other line she used to say when she would say a joke and the audience would, would freak out. She would say, oh, grow up, grow up. And that's the thing. You've got to be an adult to just have that conversation. You've got to grow up. And right now it's like children, it's little kids. You know, when I look at Trump, the, the main vibe I get is like a, of a five-year-old or a six-year-old who's like kind of been naughty and is trying to make excuse. It, he's, he's immature is the problem. If you don't go through adolescence, you can't um, engage in this uh, reality hacking. There's this sort of sense of the, the psychedelic revolution merging with the, the kind of the, the tech world and I think you said in our first interview something like, what was it, Silicon Valley dropped acid and now everyone's having a bad trip? I wouldn't say it has to do with psychedelics in particular. I mean, when, when I was with Timothy, when he uh, went on the web for the first time, and he said, this is acid, that this is as powerful as acid, and it's going to be more powerful because people don't need to ingest it in order to trip, in order to have this internet experience. And the thing Leary used to say about acid before you take acid is that you've got to be aware of your set and your setting. In other words, what's the mindset that you're bringing to it and what's the physical setting where you're going to do it. 
You know, so if you're, you know, uh, uh, you know, doing it in a war zone, that might not be the best way to trip. Or if you're starting a trip where you're thinking, how am I going to make the most money by exploiting people? And then you're dropping acid with that mindset. That's not going to lead you to a happy tripping place. And I was thinking about, you know, if the, if the digital realm is as powerful as acid, you know, what set and setting are we bringing to it? You know, we originally brought the set of, you know, human potential and infinite connection between others. And now the set and setting of the internet is extractive surveillance capitalism. So if the world is now living in a psychedelic substrate for the last 20 years with a set and setting of extraction, abuse, manipulation, and and surveillance capitalism, you know, no wonder we're having a bad trip. You know, this 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 is where we're at. And I understand people are having this, they're waking up into a nightmarish bad trip. And that's why their behavior is like this. That's why their voting is like this. That's why there there are various forms of denial and hate and and isolation and despair. I can't imagine what it would be um, to have those sensibilities uh, amplified, you know, by this kind of uh, uh, maelstrom of digital tech. Is that, I mean, how would you summarize that? Is that because basically our connections between each other and our, um, our social space has been exploited and weaponized to the point where even even sort of genuine interactions are being monetized and being extracted by this model? Is that a, a summer, sort of similar summary? Yeah, we are living with technologies that are intentionally designed to make us fearful, to make us panic, to put us back into our brain stem, to avoid our higher human thinking and our, even our mammalian thinking. And then sometimes we're trying to connect with other people over devices that are designed to make us hate and fear the other person, designed to addict us to the tech, designed to get us to interact with non-player characters, algorithms, rather than other people. And then we wonder why we feel bad. You know, if you live in a, in a digital haunted house that's designed by Stanford behavioral engineers to make you hate, to make you fear. What do you think's going to happen? You know, it's just, and then you grow up in it as a child. I mean, what do you think's going to happen to those brains? What do you think's going to happen to those to those hearts? What what do we do about it? Well, the easiest thing to do is to connect with other people in real life, meet people, kiss them, hug them, sit with them. You know. It's the easiest way. I mean, these are technologies that are designed to decalibrate you, to make you uneasy, to disconnect you from any kind of natural circadian or other rhythm. Um, so the way to, to restore that rhythm is you look in somebody else's eyes for five seconds, breathe together. You know, the con great conspiracy, just breathe together with someone else and all of these painstakingly evolved mechanisms for social coherence get reactivated. You know, we evolved to make eye contact. That's why human beings have the most white in their eyes. It's so that babies can, can really target and see what, where's the mother looking? Where's the mother's gaze? That this is part of it. And when you make that connection, that eye connection, not over Skype, but in real life, um, your mirror neurons fire, the oxytocin goes through your bloodstream, you begin to establish rapport and you start to move into sync with the other person. That's, and I hate to use a word like this, but that's the natural human condition. That's the way we make sense. That's the way we stabilize and normalize our, our constitutions. That's the way we build the frameworks that establish a society. You can't do that, however much we like to think we can. We can't do that through spreadsheets and through sort of utilitarian things. So the blockchain will not unite humanity. It could organize our numbers, but that's not where that's not where the show is. That's not where where this is actually happening. I know I think you're also familiar with polyvagal theory, 
we did a whole series around the the psychology, the science and psychology of polarization and the science and psychology of difficult conversation and found that frame. Uh, polyvagal theory, understanding exactly that, how we're intrinsically social, we're constantly looking for connections with others, and, we're, and it's generally moderated by the, the vagus nerve. Um, and I think you mentioned it a little bit in your, in your book. For me, that feels like a really important thing for us to realize. And when we interviewed Stephen Porges, he called it the neurobiology of spirituality and religion as much as it was the neurobiology of, of kind of difficult conversations. It's funny we call it spiritual. You know, when we talk about human beings being connected subtly as one great organism, we call it spiritual. But when we look at the fact that all the cells in your body are joined together to create this one thing, we call that science. You know, it's interesting. It's interesting. What, we still don't know why all the cells work together and why we don't just fall apart. I mean, I know why we stick together, but we don't know what they know and why they all do their jobs and coordinate this being. I mean, my, my God, you know, that's just as, as weird, just as strange. It's just we're more used to it. Um, but yeah, polyvagal theory, as uh, the, the, the aspect of it that's most useful to me is the idea that our nervous systems are not our own. You are not a distinct nervous system. You are part of a much bigger nervous system. And when stuff happens to your nervous system, that changes mine and mine changes yours and everybody around. That the reason why you need to get your act together is because the rest of us are living with you. The rest of us are impacted by your nervous system and its fucked upness. You know, so uh, uh, it's hard enough, you know, on our families and our loved ones and the people who are right with us dealing with our, the actual behaviors, but uh, everybody is dealing with the incoherence. You know, so we kind of owe it to our collective organism to be as coherent as possible. And if we can't be coherent, then we should at least be quiet. Yeah, I think this is a point that's been made before that in a world of ever expanding exponential tech, no one gets to be completely fucked up. Right, well, if you're completely fucked up and you're at the dashboard of, you know, the, of the net, or uh, even if you've got a powerful Twitter account, you cause a whole lot more damage than you did. It used to be just some guy would, you know, stand on an apple crate in the park and say weird stuff. I mean, and now um, the weirdest people, and not weird in the fun way, but weird in the destructive way, um, have tremendous mouthpieces. You know, they get tremendous amplification. And then when you combine that with the fact that they're being amplified on a platform that's been designed to put people into a state of terror, they're gonna get more amplification than those of us who are arguing for rapprochement or moderation or uh, even tolerance. Yeah, and you'd be a, a good person to ask about this. We had a, I had a dialogue with um, Josh Fields, the CEO of Consciousness Hacking. So their idea is that it's possible, it's, it's not implicit in tech, it's just the first generation of tools that we have and that potentially tech could also be the solution as well as the, uh, as well as the problem. Do you have time for that argument or do you think there are incentives or characteristics built into the world of tech that will, um, w will kind of act against that kind of slightly more optimistic vision? I mean, I have time for the argument, but I think it's wrong. You know, I mean, it's like, okay, now, uh, because my smartphone is making me crazy, I can now install a wellness app to try to counteract the crazy that the rest of the cell phone has put on me. Uh, I mean, as a baby step, maybe, you know, if people are so addicted to the thing that the only place to get them less addicted is through the thing itself, you know, it's like Jesus going into the, you know, temple with the money changers or something, but it's so much, uh, so much easier than that. Um, so no, I don't, I don't believe 
at this stage of civilization that we should be turning to digital devices for correctives to the problem of digital technology. I, 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 don't, I don't see it. I think it's, it's a desperate attempt mostly of, uh, mostly of digital business and people who have such a stake in it to think that there's a way out that's, that's through. And, and I, don't, I don't think there is. It's the same question as we're depleting the topsoil. We've got, you know, 30 harvests left before it's all gone. Um, do we retrieve the aboriginal permaculture methods and crop rotation and treating the soil like a living matrix? And do we, do we, re do we retrieve those sort of more ancient approaches to life and circularity? Or do we pedal to the metal? invest in Monsanto and figure out how to use chemicals to grow more crops on rocks or on the ocean or figure out how to eat salt. And, uh, and, and I think there's still enough, uh, I think we're still early enough in our descent to um, retrieve. You know, I, I, I still think we are, we are close enough to the shore of a natural human existence to rely on terra firma for our wellness. Um, but it's possible there'll be some day when we are so, uh, uh, when we're so far from what we think of human, you know, when maybe the human body is itself dispersed onto chips, onto quantum machines, where we don't really have faces anymore and whatever. And at that point, yeah, some sense of wellness in those cells and those last remaining uh, uh, biological elements of the computers. Um, yeah, that they're going to need to be massaged by apps in order to, re you know, resonate on some biological level. But I just, I just don't think we're there. Well, you don't think it's possible that, for example, we, we have social media apps at the moment that are kind of hijacking our limbic system, going for outrage, going for kind of the, the quick dopamine hit and response and you don't think it's possible to, to for that to shift so we have maybe algorithms that were designed towards growth and towards kind of a more um, kind of the higher angels of our nature or the better angels of our nature if you put a whole culture on dexedrine because you want them to be faster oh they're do oh and look how fast they're going this is great but they're having trouble falling asleep now and they're not dreaming and they're getting upset Okay, what do we do? Well, could we invent a drug that'll help them sleep while they're on dexedrine? Sure, let's do it. Let's do it to Valium and Dalmain and, and Dilaudid and things to help them sleep. Sure, you can create compensatory tech for the tech that we're using, but the best way to compensate for it is to embed oneself in nature in connection with others, in, in humans. You, you calibrate better looking face to face at another human. You could create a calibration routine that put two eyes and, a, and, and a, 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 a irises and a vibration on a screen so you stare at those eyes and slowly recalibrate your system, not as well as with a person because we don't know all the mechanisms that we've evolved for establishing uh, uh, connection with others, but you could create an ultra simplified hack of your brain to fool it into thinking it's getting calibrated. The same way you can listen to an MP3 file of a song and fool your brain into thinking it's listening to music when it's not. It's listening to an algorithmic recreation of certain aspects of music in order to convince your brain that you're hearing bass, but there's no bass going in your body. There's nothing there. So yes, we can do artificial things to create compensatory, uh, compromised experiences, but there's still food you could eat, you know, so you don't have to just have protein powders. There's still people you can have sex with so you don't have to use porn and there's still nature so you don't have to use tech in order 
to calibrate your organism to reality. You know what I mean? We're not, we're not in space. We're not in space. If you're, if you're alone in space, you're on the space station, what are you going to do? Okay, let's give that guy some apps to recreate, you know, what things are. Give him a sex doll. Give him everything that, that you got, right? Because he's stuck there in a, in a, in a space station. You know, and it, and, but I look at, at, you know, we send my daughter off to school and make her lunch. And there's like these things wrapped in plastics and, and yogurt in a thing. It's like, that's like spaceman food. It's, what are we doing? What are we doing? Right? That's, we, 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 we act as if we're living on a space station. That's how hermetically sealed everything we're using is. And that's, crazy. And that's why we're all getting allergies and autoimmune diseases and stuff. It's like everything's gotten too packaged and sterile and plastic and, and nuts. This is killing us. And we have a lot of people on our channel talking about existential risk. And you have described how there was a story you told about being kind of invited in by a load of Silicon Valley guys who were basically asking you what would happen when the cataclysm came. I don't know if you feel comfortable kind of repeating that story. I'd like to, I've got a couple of questions I'd like to ask about that. So, yeah, I, I was invited to do what I thought was a talk to like bankers or something at a resort. And um, instead of me going out on stage to do a talk, they brought these five guys into the green room who started peppering me with all these questions about the digital future, you know, like, uh, you know, Bitcoin or Ethereum and augmented reality or virtual reality. I figured it was one of these things where it's just these five billionaires looking for, you know, investment strategies from someone who's on the ground in the cyber revolution. And eventually they got around to the question of, you know, Alaska or New Zealand. Right? So they wanted to know mainly how to prepare for the inevitable collapse of society. And the question we spent most of the time on was, how do I maintain control of my security force after the event? You know, because their money's going to be worthless and these guys will turn on them. And uh, it, it just struck me that here are the wealthiest and most powerful men I've ever encountered, yet they feel utterly powerless to influence the digital future, that the best they can do is prepare for the inevitable collapse and, you know, insulate themselves from the reality that they're creating by earning money in the way they're earning it. And it was, it was sad, but it was indicative of the way these folks are thinking. You know, the, the high-level billionaires, like the, the Elon Musks and Jeff Bezos, they want to get off the planet altogether, really just leave us behind. But the mid-level billionaires who can't afford rocket ships, they want to build you know, bunkers and secret communities and get uh, robot guards and, you know, and to, to protect themselves from the rest of us. You know, and they really think that this is, that this is where it's going, or at least they, they're, they're convinced enough that they're uh, putting in 20, 30 percent of their wealth into these uh, uh, survivalist scenarios. And it's just it's a it's a it's a dark place for us to have gotten, you know, particularly the people who are building the technological infrastructure. Yeah, and I think your conclusion to that was, well, if you want to stop your, your kind of security force basically mutinying, you're going to have to treat them well. Basically, the only things that actually are going to be useful in those environments are things like trust, love, care, and the, and the soft skills, because you can't actually, the, the money isn't going to help. Right. And a legacy of doing that. You can't just start when they arrive. I mean, the joke was, I said, you know, if you really want, you know, you want your head of security to protect you, um, you know, pay for his daughter's bat mitzvah today. You know, and they all laugh because none of their heads of security are Jewish guys with, you know, uh, uh, daughters getting bat mitzvahs. But they understood what I meant. You know, if you paid for someone's daughter's bat mitzvah, then when push comes to shove, it's going to be hard for them to kill you, you know, 20 years later in the shelter because they'll think, this guy paid for my daughter's bat mitzvah. I can't just, can't just kill him. And invite them, invite the dudes, but invite their families too, you know, so that it's a, a, a community. But then you might as well invite everybody. So instead of figuring out how to insulate yourself from the future world? What if you spent your effort figuring out how to make the world a place you don't need to insulate yourself from? 
you know, which is the real answer. And they should be smart enough for that. And what was the impact of that on you, like that experience? Were you shocked or surprised by it? I was. I guess I was surprised by it because I figured if I was ever in a place with really rich people, I'd be spending the time like asking them for money to do a theater project or something or, you know. <laughs> and instead, I, I experienced them all as such kind of low level thinkers. I mean, they're smart, you know, and they could play out all of the Walking Dead scenarios with me, which is where they're at. It's sort of a, um, they're all like Sim City kind of people. They all look at everything from this, uh, I don't know, it's like a, a, a programmer's view, a game developer's view. So they're looking at the way the game is being played and they've gotten to, to, to the idea that there's going to be a last man standing, that it's this weird poker game and that one person's going to end up winning, but be utterly alone. Um, so I guess that the thing that surprised me was, was the sort of their inability to think in certain ways, kind of no matter what books they read or they can't think outside of this uh, very uh, individualist understanding of things. Uh, that, I mean, maybe it, it, partly it's what happens when you get all this money that people treat you differently, so they are really alone and they're in the worst position possible, but I don't see why it necessarily it has to happen that way. But yeah, I was a little sad. They just seemed really young. They seemed like they had very uh, childlike understandings of the world. But it's a lot of them, you know, leave college. They drop out of college when they make their first million and, you know, and keep going from there. Because this is the kind of concern I think that, that I'm hearing from a lot of people is this, the potential for some people in Silicon Valley to be kind of thinking, already thinking along those lines, and then why not just drive it off the cliff, we'll be okay. Do you get that sense that that's widespread or not? Yeah, it's either widespread that way or they're cynically, cynically thinking, you know, none of us are going to make it. Or, you know, they remind me of, I used to get these dreams when I was a kid where I'd like fall off a cliff or something, but then realize that I could kind of fly and you don't just die. Um, and I think they're thinking that that's going to, something's going to happen that will just prevent death. And they're thinking about death individually, not even uh, civilizationally. And that's, uh, it's weird, but yeah, they're gonna upload, they're gonna, something's gonna happen before. You know, and that's, you know, they're so disconnected from, from others that I get it, death is really real to them. And that there's a question I wanted to ask that we, when we did our interview before, just before you got into the lift, I don't know if you remember this, we touched on um, a subject. I, I said something like, it seems clear that the, the only solution is going to be somehow that we need to go more into the liminal. And you sort of looked at me and said, yes, definitely. And then, then the lift doors closed. And I was like, oh, that should definitely have been a big part of the interview. Um, so I have a sense of what I meant by that. But I'd love to, to, to check with you um, what you meant by that. Well, the liminal is a tricky concept for a lot of people, but I mean, the, the easiest way to describe it is, you know, we, we, we think about the ticks of the clock as the seconds, but the seconds are not the ticks. The seconds are the space between those ticks. That's where life happens. That's where everything happens. You know, the digital realm understands those ticks, everything, and it doesn't, it doesn't hear what's happening between them. And that's where love happens. That's where weirdness happens. That's where humanity lives, is in the space between the numbers. And that's where, that's where we can play, the place between when you're awake and when you're asleep. The, Eric Davis's wife wrote that great book on, uh, uh, you know, that kind of, it's not lucid dreaming, but it's that, that um, the in-between. You know, it's it's those it's those transitions where these these openings happen. It's the space between you and me. It's not you. It's not me. It's that. Ooh, what is that? 
And those are the places that, that artists really toy with. That's the weirdness of a David Lynch movie. It doesn't resolve. It's not quite one or zero. It's just in that weird place. And that's, um, I think that's our salvation, you know, because that's where you can say to people, don't you see there's something that's left behind? And that that's that's where we are. That's our place. Is that is that in between? Is that liminal? I'm not white. I'm not black. I'm not Jew. I'm not Christian. I'm not alive. I'm not dead. I'm not, you know, one. I'm not many. What is you know? What are all those in betweens? You know that that the the, the polarizing effect of of digital tech, that binary, uh, sequenced understanding of reality doesn't acknowledge. Well done for making it to the end. Just wanted to let you know a few things we've got coming up, including the biggest event we've ever done, the Rebel Wisdom Festival, which will be a mix of ideas and dialogues between people like Douglas Rushkoff, Daniel Schmachtenberger, Benita Roy, Rupert Sheldrake, John Vivekey, and many more. And because wisdom isn't just intellectual, it's also about practice, we'll be offering experiences like circling, different interpersonal dialogue, mindfulness, breathwork and many other with world-class facilitators and if you're enjoying the content you can help us make more by joining the rebel wisdom club which will give you discounts on the courses and the events and also access to a load more content on the website including all of our live events it'll also give you access to our growing community which is something we want to make a real focus for 2020 adding more meetups and other services for members so hope you enjoyed the film and see you soon